So, yeah, welcome, uh, box office. If you assume anything related to popcorn, this is not the right um, presentation, I'm sorry. Um, what I'll talk about is putting LibreOffice into a sandboxed XDG app bundle. Um, if you happen to be at Guadec this year, then most of it will sound familiar. Um, I gave pretty much the same talk back then. Um, this time I'll concentrate more on the part that we as LibreOffice will have to do to make this a wonderfully working reality. Um, so, maybe some of you even haven't heard yet about what XDG app actually is. Um, it is an initiative that um, year started a while back, um, is hosted in the GNOME or rooted in the GNOME and, and free desktop, um, hence the name, um, communities and um, tries to address two um, goals or reach two goals. Um, one thing is um, to make it easier for developers to produce binaries that will run um, on arbitrary Linux distros um, so that you just build it once and, and run it everywhere and not have this uh, problem of having to deliver it from various, um, various Linux distros. Um, the other aspect is um, there's so much software out there from people, some of you might, you might know them, others you have no idea about whom they are, what they wrote, why they wrote that actually, if there's anything bad in there, um, on the way to you, maybe somebody put something bad in there. So you want to have some, some security in, in downloading something from the internet and running it, and um, how to do that, of course, is to um, run that app in some kind of sandbox that shields the rest of your system um, from whatever that app does, so the app is limited in what it can do. Um, for us, of course, that means if we are limited in what we can do, um, we need to find ways to still let the user do what he wants to do with our app. Um, so I'll come back to that later. Um, so that's XDG app, LibreOffice you'll know. Um, to first concentrate on this part of um, building just once, run everywhere. Um, so what is our matrix of pain there? Most of you know we have hundreds of configure switches, more or less obscure ones. We have close to a hundred external submodules, but we depend on that need to be there in some way on the platform that we later run on, either we bring them with us or we depend on them being available already on the platform. We have about a hundred localizations. That's also a thing to consider if you want to package some software, you just package it for the US market, for the globalized everybody speaks English market or do you go into the individual um, locales and, and please actually place your users there. Um, so we're famous for being able to break whatever tool chain is out there and whatever framework is out there and uh, Matos created this lovely t-shirt, some people even wear it and uh, yeah that's, this is one more one more framework where we can see if we can uh, stretch its limits. So, yeah, do that. Um, as I said, for us or for, for any application that wants to go out into the world, be available, publish the source, compile yourself is one option, but most of your end users want to have some binary. Um, this is Especially as we, as with our TF hats on now, um, no, we do um, Mac builds, we do Windows builds, that's uh, plain business because there's one target to target, you just need to make sure that um, 
whatever is your base version of, of Windows or, or Mac that you want to target. When it comes to Linux, um, it, it's rather fractured because um, the Linux world is not one stable, one common API, but a lot of different individual libraries that have their IPIs and each distro bundles a different set and, and uh, uses different ways to, to deliver software, be it RPM, be it DEP, um, the libraries having different spell names to, to link against and stuff like that. Um, so what we as TDF do, for example, is to, to uh, produce um, DEP and RPM packages for X86 uh, and X86-64 um, builds. All the distros do that themselves, of course, anyway for, for their versions of LibreOffice. Um, but sometimes users do want to use um, a version that is not yet available, maybe in a, in a distro, uh, if only for testing, for example. Um, so there's demand to also have uh, builds done by TDF of the latest, the uh, for example. So our TDF build is, is somewhat crippled, or used to be somewhat crippled, for example, it's been a pain to, to update to uh, GTK3 or to get rid of this old um, GNOME VFS, which is a method of um, accessing non-file system data like uh, HTTP or FTP or uh, whatever, Samba, uh, uh, a centralized common way. There's an old implementation and a new one and we were stuck with the old implementation uh, because uh, that was the only thing uh, we could expect from a baseline that we want to run on, which is a very old Linux. Um, so, hope is that we'll reach a point where we can just build once and be done with it. Another um, thing that uh, might benefit from this is uh, our BiBiSect repos, um, which are also uh, done by somebody with a fat machine to keep us um, house warm in the winter. Um, these people just more or less randomly pick from this matrix of 100 uh, or 300 configure switches. So it might happen that by accident um, they pick one switch to build against the system lib on their machine, which then, when you download that huge um, by by sec repo, then that one little library has a different name on your machine. So that was one um, famous uh, case where you need to, with at least one of the repos, you need to, uh, if you run it on the Fedora, you need to re rename or symlink one system library into a different name so that then the um, the, 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 live, the, the the LibreOffice app will find it and be happy again. But that's unfortunate things that you download a huge bye bye sec repo to want to use it and then find out ah, there's one little issue that keeps me from, from using it. Uh, if we would use XTG app um, binaries, bundles for that, then that would be a thing that couldn't happen by definition. So, um, actually trying to, to stuff LibreOffice into this framework, how does that look like? Um, XCG app, um, as I said, is a standardized interface into which to in, in, in which a standardized environment in which uh, in what, uh, applications run. So they do define a, a very precise API of what is available. That's the one point. The other, when you do want to build such an application into this framework, then there's of course some some sort of SDK. Um, which is all the, the headers, all the libraries that you need that match um, the runtime environment. Um, that is somewhat unfortunately built off some, not some uh, vanilla Linux distro, but some Yocto distro that is mostly aimed at uh, embedded and has, as we then found out with a break every toolchain approach, um, has some slight obscurities, like uh, it's the first instance where I found a, a distro that lacks one of the obscure Perl, um, Perl archives, Perl, Perl modules, 
that we need, still need during the build because we have this legacy part of the uh, install set creation that is still based on some um, 15 year old post scripts um, help us to eventually fix that by, by removing that part of our build system anyway. What I do for now is just from the outside copy that one Perl module with some Perl file, copy that into the, the Yocto um, SDK. Um, another point, for example, was that there was no uh, glue uh, library there for the OpenGL, that is a kind of wrapper library to, to simplify things. Um, good news was well, that there was at all, uh, anyway always uh, only uh, two places, I think, in our code base that used it and that could both be um, removed, so we dropped one of our hundred uh, external dependencies um, by doing that anyway. One other thing that uh, took a while to debug is that one of our externals that we do include, um, because it is not available on the, on the base um, that we run on, um, one of them ran uh, an XML config script, which is like package config, just specially for libxml, and should give you the command line arguments to link against uh, XML config. But in this Yocto base, for whatever reason, um, that XML config bash script just com is uh, reduced to one line, which says exit one, so return failure. So the configuration of our external module, uh, I think it was Redland that uses that, um, kept failing very strange uh, errors that even for now went into the, our internal Redland module and, and, and patched that to no longer call XML config. Um, so, with that out of the way, um, configuring and building does work smoothly, um, so I disable lots of stuff that is not available in the um, base uh, there, and, and uh, some of it doesn't make, even make sense yet. For example, cups, there's no printing yet from, from inside the sandbox. Come to that in a moment. Um, there's no Java in there, so I disable Java, so the uh, solution probably, if we want to keep um, Java available for the extensions in LibreOffice, you need to bundle a JDK, a uh, JVM into our app. Um, most of the things we depend on from the system, we can use the actual system ones. There is about 30 cases where things are not available in the, um, in the runtime platform, but where we have these uh, external libraries bundled, and so we use those. Um, this is still X11 based, moving forward to Wayland. Um, for now it's 11. Um, what falls out of all that then is uh, not that small bundle of about 350 megabytes. So that's what, what users would then need to uh, download. Um, okay. How many languages do you have there? That's just one. Okay. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, maybe I'll interlude here with a little demoing of it before I come to the explanation of how the sandboxing actually works. Um, so, to you then have that um, then have that bundle, the application bundle. You can download that. You can push that up to uh, application repositories in the internet from where you then can download it. I've done all that to not uh, use too much bandwidth here. And then there's a little application that is, for example, already available in Fedora, latest Fedora releases already have this XDG app thing. And if you want to run an application uh, inside it, you do this XDG app run. And then there's a, a name for the um, application and I was called and colors surprisingly the office and you can even pass parameters in and uh, what you see is that your average vanilla standard LibreOffice sandboxed 
you don't notice much of it from the first view. But if you, for example, want to open a file, then there is a file dialog opening up and you have a home directory and um, yeah, that's, that's the sandbox part. Home directory is empty. We are running as a fake in, a, in, in an environment where you don't have your normal home directory. So this app, if it were malicious, couldn't modify your data or even read your data. There's nothing much here that we could open. We do have uh, and the, in, in the root there's an app directory where our, app, where our installation actually is. So if you know how a LibreOffice installation tree looks like, this looks familiar, that's just the tree. So we might try to open the license file that's included there and that will work. So um, read only because the installation tree is, is read only. Um, so that's not that much. <coughs> fun for, for, for actually using a, a LibreOffice. You could uh, draw your drawings in there for fun and, and then throw them away because you can't even save to outside the, the sandbox. You can save inside the sandbox so when you reopen LibreOffice your wonderful drawing that you did last time would reappear but you can't get it out there. So um, that needs to be changed and there is hope, there is change available, there's a feature and I faked that into this LibreOffice, but that's a otherwise vanilla one. I um, took the feature that we do have two different file dialogs anyway. We have the system one and we have the, 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 the LibreOffice internal one, which has a different feature set and looks the same across all systems. I took that out and replaced that with one that is the sandbox specific file open dialog. And when I use that one and now do file open, the file open dialog looks very different. Um, so I have different, this is kind of a mock up state for how it will look like in the future. So this is still all work in progress how to the, the, the XDG app framework will look like uh, in the end. And um, so for now, you can. Um, navigate into your your true home directory. So here's my documents folder. There's some test ODT. I can select that, and whoa, there it opens. Um, I have some debug code in there. So um, what it actually does open inside the sandbox is not nothing in the home directory, but there is um, a fuse file system behind the scenes. So that maps that file from outside the sandbox into some um, run user, whatever place, um, and that's the file URL that I'm using inside the sandbox. But it, by a fuse from outside the sandbox, is actually the same file as the one in my in my home here. Um, so. Where is, where is the tab key? This is the sandbox one, this is the bright one. Um, Question? Yeah? If you uh, finish or close LibreOffice and start it again, can you open the same file from file reason? Um, can you open the same file? It, uh, I'm not sure if it will be still there. There is the test. There's a test. Yeah, it, it even works with this version. This is a slightly outdated version, so things are moving quite fast um, there at the moment. But it's persistent. Yeah. Um, so running out of time. Hurry up a bit. The interesting part about the sandboxing. Um, the. For, for, for our bill, as I said in the, in the, in the beginning, uh, people are not sure about what they download from the internet. Um, that's probably not the most, or the, the biggest motivation to run LibreOffice Sandbox, but another very real and very important 
uh, use case for actually sandboxing LibreOffice is that we do have um, bugs, some of them still in our code and some of them might be security um, uh, risks. So if you do have a, a document from somewhere on the, on the internet and you don't trust its author, then it might happen that if you open that, uh, it could compromise your system. So if you do run that in a sandboxed LibreOffice, then you're much better off. So that's, that's the very real use case for, for uh, sandboxing LibreOffice. Um, so how does this uh, actually go full screen again? Um, so that, how does this uh, file accessing work? So the idea behind all this getting out of the sandbox or reaching resources from outside the sandbox, um, the philosophy behind how to do that is always there needs to be some code which runs outside the sandbox in the trusted system, so it's from your trusted Fedora distro um, that is actually executing some code on your behalf. So you initiate, while you're running inside the sandbox, you initiate some activity outside the sandbox that can access resources outside the sandbox and because you as a user and not your program behind your back, because you as a user in the UI initiate that, the um, sandboxing framework will then open a small little hole that allows that resource to be accessed from within the sandbox. So the, the magic point about it is the code that actually does the allowing and opening of the channel into the sandbox runs outside the sandbox so that the application can't um, tamper with it and the request to actually do something needs to come from the user and not from the automatically from, from the application itself. Um, so what's done with this uh, file dialog that I presented, that's the dbus uh, interface from the sandbox to the outside world. You can request to open that dialog, that dialog goes up in the outside world. Um, it's a dialog that the, the application itself can't control because it's a real GUI dialog that the user has to operate. Um, you select a file there, you have the full access to all the files there. Just that one file that you select is then made available as a set by a fuse um, to inside the, 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 the sandbox application. Um, that's the, the simple idea, the, 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 uh, the way it should work. Um, comes LibreOffice with all its uh, ideas of what it wants to know about its environment. Um, so simple apps uh, will be happy with just having that one file. Um, we, for example, want to know about uh, whether some other instance of LibreOffice locked that file uh, or there's also a feature in, in Calc to have multiple users work on the same file and then there's some, some additional file next to the original, to the file itself um, that records all that information, so we don't want to only have this one file, we want to create another file next to that, um, and that's where things start to get interesting, and um, where you need to um, make sure that your sandboxing um, features um, make that available. So you saw that the, the um, test document that I opened, that opened up in read-only mode, um, because we can't create this uh, log file next to it. Um, there's also um, the, the, the way these files uh, are made available now it's via Fuse and in a, a previous instance it was done via GIO and a special document URL scheme um, that would have had for us the benefit that uh, when we open some document via, G via GIO, we know it's from remote, so we don't try to create this log file anyway, so our code paths would already have um, taken care of some of the things that we we'll need to now take care of to make it, for example, available, uh, possible to, to, to save files. So this is for now only file open, file save will be the next thing. Um, printing is a thing that needs to be addressed. 
both in the sandboxing API as probably as well then in our code base. So there'll be a number of small uh, tweaks and fixes that'll be needed in our code to make it actually um, happily work inside the sandbox. But it, like I showed with that dialog, that was just some, some 10 lines of code to, to, to swap in using this special file open dialog. Um, I think in all these cases it won't be much work, it'll be little, little tweaks here and there. Um, another thing that will come up is how to handle these uh, 100 localizations, whether to build 100 different um, apps, each with one localization, or to bundle all the localizations and have an have a, a app that is even larger than 350 max. For the Windows, for example, the Windows uh, install that you download, that includes all the languages and then at installation time you just use uh, or choose the ones that you want to put on your hard disk. So that's uh, precedent for people downloading that much data anyway and, and, and not complaining too much about it. So it might be feasible to, to, to include all of them or the majority of them. Some other minor issues is like we try to only ever have one instance of LibreOffice running via some protocol of our own listening on some uh, Unix domain socket. This, of course, is something that is also um, uh, forbidden in the sandbox to create arbitrary sockets um, to listen on them. So, but there's also a DBus uh, service to do pretty much the same thing, so we can get used that. Um, so that's one of the things that just needs some little tweaking. And that's it for from me. So if you have any questions, now's the time. Then I think it's time for coffee. <laughs>